see you again. Good to see you. Okay, welcome. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another hour of English classes here on Verbling.com. Um, in this hour, we're going to be reading an article, and I put the article up in the Verbling chat already, so people can go there and open it up. And just let me tell you, if you have a reservation, you can use it now and join the class. And if you do not have a reservation, but you are a Verbling member, then you can join the class anytime. Uh, each class is one hour long, and you can join at any time you want. If you have to leave early, that's okay too. It's pretty pretty loose. It really depends on how you want to use this service. Also, if you are just finding Verbling, trying it for the first time, and you're trying to understand how it works, uh, we have classes every hour. Um, sometimes we have two or three English classes going on at the same time, depending on the day and the time. And right now, Verbling.com is doing a special discount, so 20% off everything. So if you want to become a member or you want to do some tutoring sessions one-on-one -on -one with one of the teachers, you can do that. So um, now's a good time to try it out. And so welcome to Nihon as well. Hi, Nihan. Hi, Lisa. <coughs> How are you? I'm I'm fine. But yeah. when I saw the topic, uh, uh -oh. <laughs> much better. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. <laughs> good. Well, I was taking your um, suggestion about keeping it light on the weekends. So yes, <laughs> and also um, I'm. You know, this is, it's light and it's interesting at the same time. So, uh, this movie that's coming up, it's yes, kind of yes. come out pretty soon. So, it's kind of an interesting thing, especially yes. in the light of uh, some of the conversations we've been having, uh, mostly with you guys. I've been having with a lot of the same students, uh, you know, about money, corruption, that kind of stuff, What it, what's happening these days with that. So... We'll talk about that. We'll read and we'll talk and we'll go into the next hour also. Okay. So, all right. And hi there, Raphael. Hi. Hey, Raphael. I was thinking about you earlier because I was running around the track. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, I was. Nice. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So, I've been, I usually go walking, but lately I've been. Since talking to you, I'm trying to like run, walk, you know, so run a little bit, walk a little bit, run a little bit, something that's like awesome. that. That's awesome. Yeah, so that's fun. You know, it's funny because when I was younger, like when I was 12, <laughs> you know, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, I used to run uh, cross country and track. So um, I used to be a runner actually when I was very young, and I haven't nice. been. I didn't run at all, really, as an adult, but um, I don't know if I really want to run a lot. But we'll see. It's you know, if it's fun and it's good, then I'll keep doing it. So it feels I'm good. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, just now, just now, you had to convince Nihan to start doing the same. <laughs> Nihan, <laughs> she's not too interested in the running, right, Nihan? Um, actually, the same story as me, Lisa. Oh, when really? I was Young, yeah, I'm a cyclist and professional oh. cyclist. Wow, cool. In university. Uh-huh. Yeah, I have huge muscles on my legs. <laughs> but, you know, when <laughs> when you... Maybe uh, I satisfy with the sport, but uh, Rafael is right. Yeah, it's necessary. But Rafael, you know, it's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <I know>. yeah. <laughs> As we can... Yeah, when you just start, uh, it comes. But the, the worst is starts, starting is you know, really hard it, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. hardest thing is to start. Since you start to you start feeling the difference, you won't stop again. You won't, won't stop. Yes. yes. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's what I was what I was thinking because um, well, I was noticing also about running is when I first start walking, it's fine. And then I start running, and even if I just start running like about a minute or a little bit more than a minute, already my legs are hurting. But then I keep walking, and then the next time I start running again, it feels better. So like the more, for a little while there, the more I'm running, I'm feeling actually better. 
And then I get to the point where I'm getting tired. So then I, <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's, it's kind of weird because it takes a little while to get into it. You know, it's yeah. like, in the beginning you're yeah. like, why am I doing but this? <laughs> the doctors suggest uh, if you are hurting, um, you have to stop for three or four uh, days, then you, uh, you need to uh, start again. Yeah. Because you, um, you don't want to force your muscles yes. in, the, in the first place. Yeah. 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 I don't know if it's hurting or just more like just sore because they're so out of shape. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know what I mean? Like, it's not uh, I know that feeling. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is so weird because when I was um, younger, it was so easy to run, you know, like a mile, you know, like four, four laps around the track or something. So easy. Now it's like, ugh. Seems so difficult. <laughs> no, Lisa, you're not old. Forties uh, yeah. are young. I, I'm not old, just my body. <laughs> I, am, I am tired of body to listen. Yeah. I really, I really tired of body. Only you, to read, I, I make me tired. Makes you tired just listening to, to talk yes. about ready. Antonio, yeah. do you run or do you do any sports? In my bedroom. In your bedroom, yeah. <laughs> on the computer. Oh, yeah. uh, work yeah. with fingers. <laughs> I, I imagine uh, I really is very. I feel me tired about. <laughs> yeah, well, you have all those books to read, all the classics that you're reading. <laughs> Rafael, uh, yeah. Rafael, you have to encourage us, both of us. Yeah, uh, Rafael, you have to motivate us. us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Rafael, um, um, when you run, do you listen to music or do you just run? No, I, I always listen to music. It's, uh, I'm, I'm addicted to listen to music when I run. I don't know, it's something. Uh, I know, it's, I, I, I just, uh, I like to run. Mm -hmm. um, like uh, with a rhythm, you know. It's yeah. I think it's more. It's here to motivate. You know, it's good motivation. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking that would probably help me too. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you. Uh, I'm gonna put it on the screen share, and I have the article too, ready to go here. But did you read this book? This book came out a couple years ago. It was pretty popular here. It got everybody into running. Um, called oh, Born wrong. Born to Run. Have you heard of that one, Afra Rafael? Uh, no, no, I never haven't heard. Mm. I'll look for it. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's it's a good story too. The guy who who wrote it, um, but he goes down to Mexico and there's like, it's kind of about these big long uh, running races that are like a hundred miles long, uh, and the the runners that run they're like super athletes and then the people who you know there's the Americans who and, and other people from other countries who train and then there's these people that are in Mexico it's just they like run all the time you know so it's interesting but um cool all right so let's read about the latest Scorsese film which let me put up here first to get to see a little picture that, um, interestingly, uh, the reviews are just starting to come out. They weren't letting the reviews come out yet because I don't think it's actually out yet, the movie. It's supposed to come out, like, on Christmas, I think. I'm not 100% sure of that, but that's what I think. Um, so, anyways, it, it stars Leonardo DiCaprio. And I also read a, a brief article the other day that said this... Uh, mm, this might be Scorsese, one of the last Scorsese films because I think he's in his 70s now and he just wants, you know, he might not make many more films. So maybe that's why he chose this one to make it so extravagant. Because <laughs> when you watch the trailer, it looks very, very um, expensive. <laughs> and yes, <laughs> exorbitant. So let's go to the article. So, Big Bad Wolf, Martin Scorsese's latest, is a showpiece of wicked cinematic exorbitance. Leonardo DiCaprio as real-life Long Island con man Jordan Belfort. 
Okay, so let me just go over the title first because that's always tells you a lot a lot of times. So it's his latest uh, is a showpiece. So a showpiece is it's like a you know it is showing you all of this stuff. It's wicked cinematic cinematic exorbitance. So wicked um, here means it's not like doesn't mean bad or evil. It means like kind of like awesome. You know if something is called wicked, it means awesome. So it's like awesome movie like over the top like so it like just too much he kind of just as you can tell from that picture that we just saw it's um it was a very expensive movie and one of the reasons why was because it had big huge scenes with lots of people lots of you know not really costumes but you know the clothes that they're wearing and um the stuff that happens it's just like everything is like to the max <laughs> that's what it means to be exorbitant um, yeah, and then it's really about a real guy, this Long Island con man. So a con man is somebody who tricks people out of their money. He cons them out of their money. So it is a, based on a true story. All right, let's read about it. <clears throat> the Wolf of Wall Street has been awarded a nose-thumbing Bronx cheer by some critics as noisy, vulgar, flashy, disgusting, and over-the-top. The same reasons they adored the talented but self-indulgent Coen brothers inside Lewin Davis, one of the dreariest, most pointless, and ludicrously overrated films of the year. Okay, it has all those things, not to mention nudity, violence, graphic sex, out-of-control drug use, and filthy dialogue. It is also sensational entertainment. Okay. Antonio, why don't you start? <laughs> okay. Uh, the Wolf of, of Our Street has been awarded a noisy tumbling, tumbling, thumbing, wrong, yeah, thumbing. Uh huh. Wrong, nose thumbing. Nose thumbing. Mm -hmm. Bronx share by some critics as noise, vulgar, fresh, flesh, the goosey, and over the top. The same reason they adore the talented, but self indulgent Coil Brothers inside Lowing Davis on the, the dreariest, most pointless and ludicrously perhaps the films of the year. Okay, it has all those things. Don't know to mention nudity, violence, graphic sex, out, out of control drug use, and the 50 diary. It's also <coughs> it's also sensational. Entertainment. Mm -hmm. Very good film. I wanted to see. <laughs> Sensational <laughs> entertainment. Yes. Okay. So there's lots of words in here. So first of all, <clears throat> a nose thumbing Bronx cheer. All right. So that is a very uh, colloquial thing. So what that means is I'm just going to show you what it means. So the nose thumbing is when you put your thumb to your nose, and the Bronx cheer is when you go <laughs> like that. So it's like, that's an expression. So cynical. it's giving like a thumbs down. What, Dehan? Kind of cynical action or something? Like, it's not good. Like, we don't like it. You know, like, it's not good. You know, it's it's when you give it a, it's like giving it a thumbs down. But it's that's what um, he's saying it got by some critics. So that's the response that the movie got or the... Uh, what they said about it. So they basically gave it like, you know, no, we don't like it. And these are all the reasons why some of the critics said they didn't like it. They said it was noisy. So, you know, from the, from the trailer you can already see there's lots going on. It's very fast, a lot of, you know, things going on. It's vulgar. That means it, you know, a lot of cussing, a lot of bad words, the way that they're not just using cuss words, but the words, they're just kind of nasty probably. You know, the way they talk to each other, the way they're joking around. It's not very polite. <laughs> uh, flashy means, you know, when you're looking at this um, picture here, you can see there's lots of partying going on. And so flashy means when you're, when you're showing things like a lot of money, a lot of nice stuff. It's very flashy. There's yachts. There's you know, a lot of money involved in this movie. And it's disgusting. So some of the stuff they show might be just gross. Like, why 
Why do we even want to watch that? And ultimately, over the top. Over the top is a phrase that just means like too much. They just went like way beyond what was necessary. It's like over the top. It's just crazy, you know? So those are all the reasons why some of the critics don't like it. And then he puts it kind of this dash here because kind of in the side, you know, he's kind of saying these are the same reasons that other, that other t um, critics recently adored or loved the talented but self-indulgent Coen Brothers. So Coen Brothers are these other two directors. So here we have Martin Scorsese for this film, and then this other film, Inside Lewin Davis, is another recent uh, movie that just came out. And this particular critic, this person who wrote the article, he thinks that that movie was dreary. It was the dreariest, so that was kind of like... Um, when something is dreary, it's just kind of boring and very um, sad and kind of like you don't really feel good. It's not like a feel-good movie, so it's kind of just a lot of nothing happening and pointless, so there's no point to the movie. It's like, what is this about? And ludicrously overrated. So ludicrous means crazy. So he's thinking they just um, loved this other film so much and he doesn't understand why because there was nothing good about it. But he's admitting that, yes, this movie, The Wolf uh, the wolf of Wall Street, has all of these things. In, and not to mention, so that means here's even more things, <laughs> includes even more things. Nudity, so people being naked, violence, graphic sex. So sometimes in a movie you might just have sex, like a sex scene. But if there's graphic sex, that means you really see a lot. You see a lot of what they're doing. So that's usually, you know... Um, is more, it's like harder for uh, American audiences to watch. And out of control drug use, so just crazy amounts of drugs, cocaine, and things. And filthy dialogue, that's another word that um, is similar to vulgar. So filthy dialogue means when they're talking to each other, they're not being very nice. They're being very, very informal and very probably using a lot of cuss words and saying rude things about other people, probably this kind of thing. But he says in this last sentence of that paragraph, it is also sensational entertainment. So that tells you right there that this guy likes it. It's sensational. It's like cool, good, amazing. Okay, I just saw that Paul joined us. Hi, Paul. How are you? Hello. How are you? Thanks. Uh... I Welcome. entered in the middle of the class, I'm sorry. <laughs> that, oh, that's okay. We just started. This was the first paragraph, and so I was just explaining there's quite a lot going on in this first paragraph. But we're talking about, um, we're just reading one movie review of this new um, movie um, with oh. Leonardo DiCaprio. So we're reading, uh, yeah, a movie review, and so we're learning a little bit about what it's about, but there's also a lot of words in here that I'm going over. Mm -hmm. Um, Nihon, did you say what is it rated? I'm sure it's rated R. Yeah. Yeah. I was I was just checking. Uh huh. The nudity is ten to ten out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> For funny, ten out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a really really tough movie. Yeah, it wouldn't be probably a movie for like uh, somebody who likes lightweight romantic comedies or something. <laughs> Something like that. That movie is uh, to ca you can watch with your kids. <laughs> no, not for kids. No, not a kid movie. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, there's going to be a lot of dialogue, but you know, that's how. It's about two. You know, basically this one guy, but he has another close co colleague who works with him, and I think a lot of the movie revolves around them. So you know, you get two young guys on drugs and making a lot of money, there's going to be a lot of uh, filthy dialogue, probably. <laughs> All right, this $100 million extravaganza is, let's face it, rampantly over the top. Hell, it's, it's by Martin Scorsese, who is always over the top. But unlike the Coen brothers, who have been getting away with murder for years... He puts thrilling stuff on the screen that is unforgettable. In good movies or bad, his never-ending collaborations with Leonardo DiCaprio and his last one, The Pretentious Shutter Island, was a real stinker. 
Always fill the screen with something good to look at. This time, it's all true. Okay, Neha. Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, $100 million extravaganza is, let's face it, rampantly over the top. Hell, it's by Martin Scorsese. Who is always over the top, but unlike the Khan brothers, who have been getting away with murder for years, he puts thrilling stuff on the screen that is unforgettable. In good movies or bad, his never-ending collabora collaborations with Leonardo DiCaprio and his last one, The, pre uh, pre the Pretentious Shutter Island, was a real stinker. Always fill the screen with something good to look at. This time, it's all through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so this critic, I mean, every critic has their own opinions of directors and actors and everything. So, you know, he says here, um, it was a million, a hundred million dollar extravaganza. Extravaganza is just like a big, like, party kind of thing, like a big, huge um, undertaking or event or something that you do in a very big way that's what you call extravaganza but he says let's face it so let's you know talk about the facts it really is rampantly over the top it's like uncontrollably over the top it's it's excessive you know you could say it like that but you know hell it's by Martin so that means like what do you expect right he's always over the top and then this sentence here tells you what he thinks about the Cohen brothers. <laughs> so he says they have been getting away with murder. So that's the verbal structure there. For years. So this phrase right here means, you know, they've been, uh, you know, a lot of critics have liked them, um, but uh, that's what it means. To get away with murder means you, people uh, believe you even though you're telling a lie maybe or maybe they think you're doing something great when it's really not that great. So they're not very critical, he's saying, of the Coen brothers. Um, but they're saying that at least Martin Scorsese, he puts actual really thrilling stuff. So thrilling would be, like, exciting. At least it's, I mean, it is entertainment. You know, it is a movie. It's not a documentary. So it's there to entertain you. And so that's what he's doing. He's creating something that is, you know, in this guy's mind, unforgettable so you know something you will remember for a while and then this he just is talking about his never ending collaboration so Martin Scorsese had has worked with Leonardo DiCaprio in a lot of movies and the last one I guess was a not a very good one a stinker means like it wasn't good so it's a, it stinks mean like you know uh, you hold your nose because it was so bad so it was wasn't very good I don't know. Did you see that one, Nihan? Shutter Island? Of course I see. And what did you think? I, um, I rate 4 out of 10. Okay, it, yeah. It, it, it was a cliche. It wasn't really good. Yeah. So the word pretentious here means when you try to make something more important than it really is. You know, so maybe, I don't know what Shutter Island was about, but maybe it was supposed to be this amazing thing and it really wasn't very good so that's what it that's what that means yep. all right and this time you know the interesting thing is that the the movie is true it's not just for entertainment it is telling a true story at the same time that it's being you know out over the top crazy terence winter's action packed screenplay about the rise and fall of jordan belfort is based on the confessional memoir by the reckless multimillionaire stockbroker who served nearly two years in prison for defrauding high-profile investors in a Wall Street corruption scandal that included banking industry big shots and celebrities. A few bold-faced names have been changed to avoid litigation. Okay, Paul. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you read that uh, paragraph for us also, again? The same one I just read you re read. Uh, Terence Winter's action-packed screenplay about the rise and fall of Jordan Belfort is based on the confessional me memoir, yeah? Yeah. Uh, by the reckless multimillionaire uh, stockbroker who served nearly two years in prison for 
defrauding high-profile investors in a Wall Street corruption uh, corruption scandal that included banking industry, big shots, and celebrities. A few bold face names have been changed to avoid litigation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Terence Winter, he is the person who wrote the screenplay. So the screenplay is the name of uh, what when you take a book or a novel or a story or something and you turn it into a movie that's now called the screenplay. It's not the novel, it's the screenplay. So it's the script that they're going to use to make the movie. And it is full of action. And you can see that even in the trailer. It's very lively. Lots of stuff happening. And this is common that when we describe when somebody is very successful and then they um, become unsuccessful, something happens to them, we call that the rise and fall. So this is the rise and fall of this person Jordan Belfort so he's a real person and so it's based on his confessional memoir so in real life he did go to jail and while he was in jail he wrote his memoir which is means his memories so um, it's about his life during this time and it's a confessional because he was basically confessing telling the truth about things that he did that probably uh, were not good, like all the drugs, all the sex, all the, you know, things that he was doing. Whenever you confess something, you're confessing something about, you know, something you weren't supposed to be doing, something that maybe was illegal or wrong in some way. So that's what he had very um, reckless behavior. If somebody's reckless, they're just doing crazy stuff, crazy stuff that can get them into um, trouble. And the main thing, I mean, he did a lot of crazy, weird stuff, of course, because of all the drugs and the money and whatever, but the the main thing is that he, the way he got his money was by defrauding investors. So he was basically a crook. He was, you know, um, when you defraud somebody, it's like you lie to them. So he was lying to them. And scan a corruption scandal is like, the, all the news around the corruption. So it was a big scandal that when they caught him, you know, because it was like big shot people who were included in the banking industry, but also celebrities, so like movie stars and things, were investing with him and they lost all their money. It doesn't tell us in this um, article, but in real life, I think he he was supposed to pay back like $140 million or, or something like that. So it was a, quite a lot of money with a lot of different people that he um, he defrauded. All right, and then, of course, this is just saying that some of the names in the movie, some of the big names, like maybe some of the movie stars or something, they were changed so that they wouldn't get sued. Litigation is when somebody takes you to court and sues you to you know because they don't like the way you talked about them or, or something. Clocking in just short of three hours running time it needs a pair of scissors another trip to the editing room and an intermission but if you don't have a bladder problem the wolf of wall street goes by as fast as a nap by the pool in acapulco the saga is long and mr scorsese seems hell-bent on filming every minute of it but he never wastes your time doing it okay rafael Clocking in just short of three hours running time, it needs a pair of scissors, another trip to the editing room, and an intermission. But if you don't have a bladder problem, the wolf of Wall Street goes by as fast as the nap by the pool in Acapulco. The saga is long, and Mr. Scorsese seems hell-bent on filming every minute of it, but he never wastes your time doing it. Yeah. Okay, so clocking in, that refers to how much time when you clock in a certain amount of time. You know, it's clocking in at, we say usually, clocking in. But this is just short. So clocking in just short means under. So it's just about three hours, just a little bit under three hours running time. That's how, how long the movie runs. So he's saying it needs a pair of scissors, so it needs to be shorter. 
It needs another trip to the editing room, so maybe they could have done some better edits with the, the material. And an intermission. An intermission is usually what you have during a play, where you have a break after the first hour, then you have a little bathroom break, and then you come back for the second part of the play. So in a long movie like this, he's saying it could use an intermission. But if you don't have a bladder problem, so that means if you can hold yourself and you don't have to go to the bathroom, <laughs> you don't have to go pee, then um, the Wolf of Wall Street goes by as fast as a nap by the pool in Acapulco, which is a famous resort in Mexico, which is basically slow. So it goes, um, well, a nap goes by pretty slowly. So it's pretty long. The saga, so it's a long story, goes on and on and on. And he seems hell-bent on. That's a phrase where if you describe somebody as being hell-bent on something, it means they're going to do it no matter what. He's just going to do it. And what he's hell-bent on is, is you know filming every single minute of this very long story. But in the end, he says, he never wastes your time doing it. So apparently this critic liked it, even though it was long, even Lisa. though it could have used, yes, uh, repeat it. Hell bent hell, on. Hell bent on. What means? I don't understand. It means determined. Like if you are very determined to do something, you want to do something um, very okay. badly, you're going to do it no matter what. You're hell bent on it. So okay. he really wanted to, you know, just show us everything is what he's basically saying. He was hell bent on filming every minute of it. He was going Thank to... You. Yeah, he was just going to show us everything. All right. I understand. Uh-huh, good. Uh, Anything I, else? Anybody else have any questions about any of these words, phrases? Okay, the movie opens with a naked Mr. DiCaprio snorting cocaine from the graphic spaces between a hooker's wide-open legs. Use your imagination, dude. And we're uh -huh. off to the races. The sprawling narrative moves around in jumping time frames narrated by Mr. DiCaprio in passages from the Belfort book that take you from his arrogant beginnings as a 22-year-old penny broker from Long Island, one of hundreds of Ivy League pinstripers anxious to conquer the world of finance, climbing out of the ashes of Black Monday, to sell penny stocks at six cents per share in his own self-made investment brokerage firm operating out of an abandoned storefront. All right, there's a lot going on in that one. Okay, Antonio, why don't you read that one for us? Uh, the movie opens with a neck the Mr. DiCaprio's unearthing cocaine from the graphic space between the hawker's wide open legs. Use you, your imagination, dude. And where off the race. The sprawling, 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 narrative move around the in jumping time is time frames narrated by Mr. DiCaprio in passage from Belfort book that take you from his arrogant beginnings as a 22 year old pen broker from Long Island. On the owner of the owner of the Eve League being stripped at axios to conquer the world of financing, claiming all the, all the ashes of Black Monday to sell penny stocks at six cents per share in his, his whole self made investment brokerage, brokerage film operating, operating out of an abandoned. Storefront. Storefront. Mm -hmm. Storefront. Okay. And this right here is Long Island. So this is the S is silent. We don't say it. Long Island. Long Island. I Island. Yeah. Okay. Island. Yeah. Right. So the movie opens. That means it starts. So here we have Mr. DiCaprio. He's naked and he's snorting cocaine. So that's what you do with cocaine. <laughs> To snort something means you um, put it up your nose. You snorting is that action when you uh -huh. kind of like breathe in with your nose and the cocaine goes up inside your nose. That's what they're talking about. 
And the graphic, again, graphic here means when you can see things. So you can, like, see between this lady's legs, and he's telling you to use your imagination. Um, mm. In the movie, you see lots of hookers. So hookers, you guys probably know, are prostitutes. They're paying these women money. Um, and then he says, we're off to the races. So w when you say we're off to the races, it means we're, s we're beginning, we're starting. And that's how the movie opens. So already he's basically saying in this sentence that right from the very beginning, it's already like over the top crazy. Like that's a very, very provocative way to start a movie with a very provocative scene. And it just keeps going from there kind of thing. The sprawling narrative. So the narrative is the the movie itself, the way it's told, the story. He says it's sprawling. It goes like everywhere. If something is sprawling, it's like going in every direction. So it's it's going every place. And there's these jumping time frames. So maybe it's going from you know one time period to the next time period to the next time period, and it's all being narrated or told by the main character, Mr. DiCaprio. Um, and these are, you know, passages. So, that, um, Antonio, for that uh, pronunciation, it's passages. And this means, like, little parts of the book. So little parts from the actual book, these are the narrations that uh, DiCaprio's saying as the story is being told. So he, this guy, it's amazing to think of him as a real-life person. He's not a very likable character. <laughs> His arrogant beginning. So when you know already he was a kind of a thinking he was very special kind of guy. He was arrogant, and he was only 22 years old. He was a penny broker. So a broker is somebody who sells stocks and bonds, and the penny broker means you you sell them like really for pennies on the dollar. So instead of like you know a hundred dollars, four hundred dollars per share, it's just pennies. So it's just small amounts of money. Uh, let's see. He was one of hundreds of Ivy League pinstripers. So that means like just graduated guys in their pinstripe shirts. So shirts that have those like nice like stripes on them. And they all are ready and anxious to conquer the world of finance. So they all want to go in there and like make millions. Climbing out of the ashes of Black Money Monday. Black Monday was a uh, Monday when the stocks went really down. And so he just he created his own investment brokerage firm. So that's what he created. All right, so that's where he started. His fledgling staff is headed by Donny Azoff, Azoff, supercharged Jonah Hill, a pudgy wannabe who is, who is so dumb he thinks jujitsu is a town in Israel. Moving it up a notch, Belfort graduates to selling blue chip stocks for 50% commissions, and a hatchet job in Forbes catapults him to superstardom. Okay, Niha. His fledgling staff is headed by Donny Azolf, supercharged John Hill, a pudgy one of wannabe who is so damp he thinks jujitsu is a sound in his drive. Moving it up a notch, Belfort graduates to selling blue chip stocks for 15th person commissions and a hat hatch job in Forbes uh, catapults uh, what was it? C catapult? Catapults means like um, when you catapult something it means you throw throw it mm. so it throws him into or like pushes him into star super stardom okay <laughs> yeah so there's a lot of things his fledgling staff so his staff is um kind of like getting started so when you look at the trailer it's like he starts off with just a couple of guys and then it gets bigger and then it gets bigger and then it gets bigger so fledgling means like it's just a beginning you know it's like a beginning staff is headed by uh, the actor Jonah Hill. He, who his character is a pudgy, so he's a little bit on the chunky side, a little bit um, fat. But we pudgy means just like a little bit. But he's a wannabe. A wannabe is somebody who wants to be. <laughs> so he something. wants to be something, right? <laughs> so he he's a wannabe uh, rich person, probably. He wants to be wealthy. Yeah. yeah. But he thinks jujitsu, which is the martial arts, <laughs> is a town in Israel. 
but moving it up a notch. So when you move something up a notch, you make it. Um, uh, you go. You succeed to the next level. So you move it up to the notch. So he graduates from selling the um, penny stocks. Now he's going to the blue chip stocks, which are the better stocks that pe more people buy. And he's getting 50% commissions on them. So he's getting half of what it costs the investor to, to purchase them. He gets that much. And then a hatchet job, I'm not exactly sure what he's referring to, but a hatchet job is usually, um, you know, Forbes magazine, uh, first of all, Forbes magazine is a very f um, popular business magazine. So they report on businesses, entrepreneurs, stocks, things like that. So he got... Um, written up in that magazine but it doesn't it does I don't know if it's a good thing hatchet job usually means it wasn't a good thing but a lot of times in for um, famous people it, you know when they're writing about you it doesn't matter if it's good or bad at least you're being out there in the media you know so <laughs> and catapults that's the word uh, meaning to push him or catapult to, and it, it just means like you go from being nothing to all of a sudden you're like Superstar, you know, you're like a big person, so mm -hmm. that's what that's what happened to him. Um, to grow very fast. Perhaps. Yes, exactly. Yes. Uh, because, TJ, uh, yeah. Is word, uh, yeah. Superstar dome is very strange for me. Is it? Yeah. Super See, this is this is an actual catapult. So if you put something in there and you fling it, it goes very far, right? Ah, yes. That's a catapult. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So if something like getting your name in Forbes magazine catapults you, it like it like flings you or throws you or pushes you or whatever you want to say into like this other realm of of celebrity, you know, being super stardom. So it's a noun and it just means he now he's very famous. So that's what happened to him. He became very famous. Very famous. Okay. Uh-huh, exactly. Super stardom. Um, by the year he turned 26, he made $49 million, funneling most of it up his nose, orgies on chartered planes with 50 hookers and enough drugs to fly without gasoline, a weekend that cost $2 million plus the renovation of an entire floor of the Mirage Hotel, marriage to a gorgeous playgirl who becomes his long-suffering wife and the mother of his child, a stunning Margot Robbie who is worth keeping an eye on for more reasons than one, with a 150-foot yacht as a wedding present. Okay, Paul. You can read that one. Paul, are you there? Raphael, you want to read that? Maybe he had to go a minute. Okay. Uh, by the year he turned 26, he made $49 million, finally most of it up his nose. Orgies on charter planes with 50 hookers and enough drugs to fly without gasoline. A weekend that cost $2 million plus the renovation of an entire floor of the Mirage Hotel. Marriage to a gorgeous player who becomes his long-suffering wife and the mother of his child, a stunning maggot Robbie, who is worth keeping in a, keeping an eye on, for more reasons than one, with a 150 foot yacht as a wedding present. Mm -hmm. So after only four years, because it said he started when he was 22, so in only four years he made 49 million dollars already, and this is of course the reference to his uh, cocaine use. So funneling most of it up his nose. So basically funneling, um, uh, this is a funnel. I'll show you what a funnel is, uh, this kind of apparatus here. But he's, usually you funnel something down into something, but he's um, putting it up his nose. So basically that's what he means. He's wasting all of it on cocaine is what that sentence actually means. Orgies, that's when, you know, you have a lot of hookers, a lot of people having sex, um, and chartered planes, so private planes, um, and enough drugs to fly without gasoline. That just means 
there were so many drugs there that people were flying. So when people are on drugs and the way that they act, we call that um, high flying. Um, they're kind of out of it, you know, they, you can't speak right, you know, they're, that's called high flying. So that's what he's talking about. There were so much drugs, you know, so many drugs on the plane and people taking them that everybody was flying even without the, the gasoline, okay. Um, a weekend that cost $2 million, yes. The renovation, when you renovate something, it means you over, you, you do it over again, so you, you know, like fix it up. Maybe you put in new carpet, new floors, you paint the walls, that kind of thing. So he's just describing in this paragraph all the different things you see in the movie. So here's another one. He got married to a gorgeous, means beautiful, playgirl who becomes his long-suffering. So that doesn't um, that tells us that it wasn't a good uh, relationship. <laughs> and it's played by this person, Margot Robbie, who's stunning, which means she does a great job. And he says is she is worth keeping an eye on. That means, you know, look for her again in other movies because obviously she did a good job, but then he says for more reasons than one. So she must be pretty also means, you know, keep looking at her because she's beautiful as well. All right. You get it all in lush knockout set pieces that look like they were designed for Technicolor. No wonder Leo smelled the film with enough excess to make the great Gatsby look like Tobacco Road. Consuming enough drugs to sedate all of Manhattan, Belfort and his sidekick Donnie pull out the stops, most notably in a very long sequence in which they overdose on quaaludes and vodka in the middle of a botched attempt to smuggle two million dollars out of a Swiss bank. Moving from the living room to a country club and back again, plummeting down a flight of stairs, projectile vomiting, smashing up cars, and wrecking the furniture. All right. Paul, are you there yet? Do you want to read? Your microphone is muted now. If you, if you want to read, you have to unmute the microphone. Nope. Okay. Antonio? Antonio? Excuse me. Uh, you get it, yes? Yeah, you get it. You get it? All in lush. No, no. Knock set out. Uh, excuse me. Knock out set piece of look like they were designed for Technicolor. No old low smelled and filled with enough sex of to make it. the great guest look at the Tobacco Road. Worry? Right. Mm hmm. Consuming enough drugs uh, to say that all of my heart before his sidekick, Donnie, put out, put out the stops, mostly notable, in very long seconds in which they are overdosed on quillus and mm -hmm. vodka in the middle of Boche attempt to smuggle. Uh, Two, two millions out of the Swiss bank, moving from living room to country, club to back again, plumbing, plummeting, plummeting down a flight of stairs, projectly, vomiting, smashing up cars and wrecking the furniture. Mm -hmm. Good people. Good <laughs> people. <laughs> yeah, we're crazy, yeah. So this movie, you get it all in lush. Um, lush means lots of, uh, it's very extravagant. Lots of color, lots of stuff going on. Knockout set pieces, the, that means if something is described as knockout, it's like amazing. So the sets are really amazing, uh, very colorful, just like they were designed for Technicolor. And he says, no wonder Leo smelled a film that means like when you know he found the film with enough excess to make the great gatsby look like tobacco road i didn't see the great gatsby but when i saw the trailer for this one i thought it's it looked similar to the great gatsby with no. all the big scene no not at all no no no, right. no. it's a I, musical um, it's a funny one but the great gatsby uh, yeah I mean, uh -huh. the common thing is DiCaprio is the wealthiest man in the country 
Yes, that's what it just seemed like in terms of like the partying and the stuff that yeah, goes yeah. on. Yeah, that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah, throwing big parties for uh -huh. celebrities or something. Yeah, it, it was a funny movie. Oh, okay, all right. So then you know he's just saying this is a whole long thing of more things that we see in the movie. So his sidekick, so that's his friend who's working. Your sidekick is the person who works with you and like always goes with you everywhere. It could be your friend or your um, coworker or somebody like that. They pull out the stops. They means it means they don't stop at anything actually. So they're just doing everything: drinking, taking drugs, you know, getting in trouble, getting sick, falling downstairs, you know, smashing up cars. They're just going over the top, crazy. And, you know, they're young 20-something-year-olds with a lot of money and on a lot of drugs. All you can do is observe all of this wicked cinematic exorbitance with your mouth wide open, follow all of the illegal tricks they pull to climb the ladder to success, and wait for the crash. In the meantime, you can thrill to Leo's loosest, most passionate performance to date and applaud Mr. Hill who matches his madness every step of the way. The movie fails to make any of its characters appealing, and I didn't much care what happened to them. But when the downfall comes at last, propelled by handsome Kyle Chandler as FBI investigator Patrick Denham, I was almost sorry to see their escapades coming to an end. Others were racing for the exit doors. <laughs> okay, Nihon. All you can do is observe all of these big cinematic exorbitance with your mouth wide open, follow all the illegal tricks they pull the climb, the ladder to success, and wait for the crash. <laughs> In the meantime, you can thrill to Leo's loosest, um, most passionate perf performance to date and applaud Mr. Hill, who matches who matches his madness every step of the way. The movie fails to make any of its characters appealing, and I didn't much care what happened to them. But when the downfall comes at last, propelled by handsome Kyle Chandler as, FB Chandler as FBI, FBI investigator Patrick Denham, I was almost sorry to see their es 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 um, mm -hmm. hard to pronounce es um, escapades escapades coming to an end. Others were racing for the exit doors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So you're watching all this wicked stuff. So this crazy, wild, you know, exorbitant, like over the top stuff, and you you can't help but like sit there with your mouth wide open going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, how did they do this? And, you know, because they're, they're doing a lot of illegal things as they climb the ladder to success. But, of course, the crash comes, so their downfall comes at some point. Um, but in the meantime, what this critic is saying is that it, it's thrilling to watch Leo because as an actor... He is very passionate in this performance, and he's very loose. That means he's very, like, fluid. He's not, like, uptight or anything. So, um, and Mr. Hill, he's the other actor, who matches his madness every step of the way. So Leonardo's playing this very crazy out there kind of guy, and Mr. Hill's right there able to act that same way. So they're, like, doing a good job together. Um, but, of course, you don't really care about the characters. You know, it says it fails to make any of them appealing. It's not like you love these people. You don't want them to get hurt. You don't really care what happens to them. But, he says, you know, um, when they finally get, you know, caught, basically, you're kind of sorry to see it end. And escapades refers to the adventures. So the escapades that they're having or the adventures that they're having, all these crazy things that they're doing. Um, they're kind of entertaining for you if you're this critic. And then he says, others were racing for the exit door. So, you know, after three hours of this, you know, some moviegoers might be tired of it or they didn't, they don't want to watch that kind of excess or that lifestyle. So they were 
racing for the exit doors. They wanted to get out of the movie. They didn't like it. From bit parts by Matthew McConaughey, Jean Dujardin, from the artist, Christine Ebersol, Rob Reiner, and Fran Lebowitz, to Ahmad, or Ahmad Jamal Jazz and Brioni Suits, the movie wears its labels well. The sets are ravishing. The cinema photography, the cinematography dazzles. There's so much going on that you don't blink for fear that you might miss something. Did I say over the top? I meant over the moon. Against my better judgment, there were times in the Wolf of Wall Street when I was over the moon myself. Okay, Raphael. Uh, from Beach Park by Matt McConaughey, John Dujardin, the artist, Christine Ebersol, Rob Reiner, and Fran Lebowitz to Armand Jamal Jazz and Bryony Suits. The movie wears its labels well. The sets are ravishing. The cin cinematography dazzles. There is so much going on that you don't blink for fear that you might miss something. Did I say over the top? I meant over the moon. Against my better judgments, there were times in the Wolf of Wall Street when I was over the moon myself. Mm -hmm. So from bit part, so a bit part means very small part. So these, you know, pretty famous actors have little parts of the are in little parts in the movie. And he says the movie wears its labels well. It means it did a good job of presenting, you know, these very trendy, exciting kind of, you know, labels, these brands or whatever. The sets, so the sets are, you know, each scene has a set, whatever that is. And he says they are ravishing. So ravishing means, like, beautiful, just really um, nice to look at. Uh, might be the colors, it might be the actual stuff. The cinema photography, so the way that it was shot as a movie is dazzling, so it's very exciting to watch. And there's a lot going on. You don't want to blink for fear that you might miss something. So you don't even want to close your eyes and blink a little bit because you might miss something. So much is happening all the time. And he just wants to reiterate or say again that it really was over the top, but also over the moon, which means just like just crazy, over the top, excessive. And he even says, like, against my better judgment. So even though, you know, I knew better, Sometimes he found himself feeling you know, like really ex over the top or excited about what he was watching. So it sounds like to me like this this guy was he liked the movie, you know, for lots of reasons. Even though it's not, he didn't portray it as like, you know, just an amazing thing of art, like um, meaningful. It's not a very deep movie, you know, in terms of the character development or something like that. But it was fun. It's more like fun to watch, is what. I guess this critic would say something that was enjoyable to watch on different levels for different reasons. So, Raphael, you're not so interested in this type of movie? Uh, no, it's not a, my specific kind of movie. Uh, I don't know. I don't feel that interesting in that movie. Uh -huh. I want to see. I want to see. Very good. You want? Raphael, did you watch the trailer? Think about again about the budget. Yeah, hundred million dollar. It's a oh, lot. It's yeah. a lot of money. Yeah, maybe, maybe this, this can influence me in order to see this movie. I don't know. Let Let's see. Let uh, I wait you to see and you tell me if it's <laughs> good or not. Okay. Well, I wasn't sure if I was gonna see it in the movie theaters or not because I was thinking like, I didn't know if it was a movie I wanted to give my money to. You know. But yes, I, I do want to see yeah. it. Yeah, I, I do want to see it. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna end and, this one. If you got, if you guys want to oh, talk, yes, let's talk perfect. in the next text hour. Okay. Okay.